So it's a pleasure to talk about the role of polycombs in cancer. Today I'm going to break my talk up into four sections. So we're going to start off with an introduction about polycomb. Then we're going to move on to some of the early connections between polycomb and cancer. And then really to the more recent revolution since next generation sequencing, we found a lot of mutations in genes that encode polycomb group proteins, both activating and inactivating mutations. We we'll talk about that and then we we'll move on towards the end to how we can use all this information towards uh, new uh, cancer therapies and we'll give a little bit of a perspective on what I think will happen in the next few years. Okay, so polycombs, what are they? Well, they were identified in Drosophila as being repressors of Hox genes, homeotic genes. So here's a, a classic experiment. You can see on the left a wild type embryo and you can see it's staining for this particular Hox gene, ABDB. So, of course, it's expressed in this particular region of the embryo. And if you look at the right side of the slide, you can see here is a polycomb mutant. So, it lacks the uh, gene or it's mutated in the gene that encodes the polycomb protein. And you can see the Hox gene is still expressed where it should be expressed. But, of course, it's upregulated in regions of the embryo where it shouldn't be expressed. So the classic phenotype of polycomb is shown on this slide, and that is that it is required for the repression of Hox genes, the maintenance of the repression of these Hox genes during development. Okay, so polycombs, as I said, are repressors of Hox genes, and when these early genetic studies were done, the Drosophila geneticists wanted to find out other genes that could rescue this phenotype. And here's another classic experiment where these scientists have discovered kind of like the opposite of polycombs, which are called a group of genes called Tritorax group genes. So just to take you through this slide, here are uh, stainings for the SCR Hox gene, and these are leg imaginal discs. So you can see the imaginal disc of leg one, two, three. The, the main point from the wild type stainings here is that you'll see that the particular Hox gene SCR is highly expressed in this leg and much less expressed in this leg and this leg. Again, when you knock out a polycomb, you can see the Hox gene is getting upregulated here and here. So that's the classic, again, polycomb phenotype of derepression of Hox genes. So what they did was they screened many, many genes to see if they could rescue this phenotype. And you can see here they found, they actually found many genes, and they call these genes tritorax group genes. And you can see here, so if you have a double mutant of a polycomb and a tritorax, you can, again, more like go back to wild type where you have lower levels of this particular Hox gene in uh, leg two and leg three. So to put that into perspective, and, and of course there was many, many other studies, but what we now know is that tritorax and polycomb group proteins are probably, in my view, of course I'm biased, but they're probably two sets of the most interesting epigenetic regulators in terms of developmental biology. And what we think of them as being is very important for cellular memory. Um, what happens, of course, in early development is that transcriptional activators and transcriptional repressors set gene transcription effects. But it's actually the tritorax and polycombs that maintain these uh, either on or off states during subsequent cell division. So you can see that depicted here. Here's a transcriptional activator activating this gene. And then through many, many subsequent cell divisions, the, the tritorax group proteins that maintain the active state of this, this uh, gene here. And you can see that the transcriptional activator is often not even expressed in these cells. Similarly, so with polycombs, a transcriptional repressor will repress a particular gene in a particular cell at a particular time. But it's actually polycombs that will take over and maintain the repression of that gene during many subsequent cell divisions. So that if you remove polycomb early in development, you get the upregulation of Hox genes. So um, I would look at polycombs as really being maintainers of a particular um, gene transcription state, repressed state, and not actually active repressors as such. Okay. So how do polycombs work? What are they? What do the genes encode? Of course, they encode proteins, and these proteins uh, form multi-protein uh, complexes, most famously polycomb repressive complex 1, as depicted here, and polycomb repressive complex 2. We'll probably talk a little bit more about polycomb repressive complex 2 today. Um, what we know is that 
In Drosophila, we have a protein called EZ, and it has two homologs in mammals, EZH1 and EZH2. We'll talk a lot about EZH2 today. Um, EZH2 is in the PRC2 complex together with EAD, uh, at least in mammalian cells it's called EAD, and SUS12. We'll talk a lot about SUS12 and EAD later on. Just to say there's another complex, the PRC1 complex, and this contains, again, many more proteins in mammals compared to Drosophila, but if you think about it, um, through evolution, um, we have similar in terms of the multi-protein complex, uh, complexes, we have a similar sort of a structure in that we have a PRC2 and a PRC1 in Drosophila right up to mammals. So these multi-protein complexes are conserved through evolution. Okay, so how does it work? Well, um, we have another PRC1 complex called the non-canonical PRC1 complex, and we won't talk about too much about that today. Okay, so how does it work? Well, probably the most important um, discovery in terms of the biochemistry, the PRC2 complex, was the discovery of its activity. And what this slide is depicting is the biochemistry to do histone methyltransferase uh, um, enzymatic uh, um, acids. So you can see here, here's the PRC2 complex purified, and what they do is they mix it with histone H3, so this is recombinant histone H3, uh, either wild type or recombinant histone H3 mutated at the various lysines along the uh, tail, so lysine 4, 9, 27, 36, and 79. And what you can see is the purified PRC2 complex can methylate all of these except one. So it's not able to methylate recombinant histone H3 if you mutate lysine 27. So this tells us, of course, that the PRC2 complex is remarkably specific. It only methylates at lysine 27, whereas the SUVAR enzyme, which is famous as being a histone H3 K9 methyltransferase, it will not methylate um, the his recombinant histone H3 if it's mutated at lysine 9. So these, these enzymes, these histone metal transferases are specific. Um, EZH2, of course, is the actual metal transferase uh, enzyme, but it needs its friends, so it's 12 and E, so on, and so on for this activity. So to look at the EZH2 protein, and this will actually become important later when we look at some of the EZH2 mutations in cancer. So importantly, I draw your attention to the set domain. So this set domain is required for the histone metal transferase activity of EZH2 and EZH2, of course, in the PRC2 complex. 